you could recommend one sales channel, whether it's Etsy or build their own website or mm -hmm. craft markets, one sales channel to start with. No, that's, that's easy. We get a lot of flack for this. So I'm here at WorkbenchCon and I found somebody. This is Ryan from Cutting It Close. So for everyone that doesn't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. But when I was 16, I really started, got into woodworking, bought my first saw from Harbor Freight. Three years later, bought my first CNC uh, for $6,000 way back when. Pushing ever since and growing. We had a couple hit products that we did a couple million dollars in sales on. Now I have 28 full-time employees. We have five CNCs. Um, a little over $840,000 worth of equipment in the shop, 12,000 square foot shop. Love making content, so I have a YouTube channel called Cutting It Close that I make content on that I try to help very similar to what Andy's doing um, and why I really like and why we're sitting together talking. I'm um, trying to help CNC business owners kind of understanding how to scale and how to make money and, and just how to really enjoy the process of CNCing and CNCing business. So, Ryan, first, what advice do you have for CNC entrepreneurs facing setup challenges when they first acquire their machine? Quick answer to that one, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, and so that's why you have to be a part of a community that knows what you don't know. And so just reaching out to the people that I say are nerds over that stuff and that know more than me on that particular, whatever that issue is, is the best way to do it because it's gonna save you time, it's gonna save you a lot of energy, it's gonna save you a ton of headaches. And so um, I've, always, I've always been a big, big community guy, a big, fan of reaching out to people that just knew a lot more than me and that's okay. Uh, number two, uh, how do you recommend approaching uh, product development? Like how should a new person that got a CNC should approach uh, product development? So this one's probably my biggest bread and butter and interesting question so far. <laughs> um, so product development, um, you know, with wood, do not think you're ever gonna reinvent the wheel. Like don't, don't try to come up with something new because when you come up with something new, you have to then teach how to use that new product and then you're facing two hurdles. And so what I've always told people is just like, find a product that works and iterate on it and make it slightly better. You know, make it 5%, 10% better. And then that's gonna push you, whether it's changing the type of wood, whether it's increasing the size, whether it's moving one part to one side or the other, doing those little tweaks or those little hacks are what I have built my business on. Um, because like I always, I always tell people, you know, the chances of you thinking something new in woodworking that's never been invented, invented um, are gonna be few and far between because woodworking's been around for thousands and thousands of years. So it's very unlikely that you're gonna have an original idea. So just make iterations on ideas that are already working and make them slightly better. And I'm not saying steal people's stuff. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Do it in your own creative way that really defines like your creativity. And so as you progress, that creativity will follow you and then you build a brand around your creativity and your initial iterations on products that you're designing. We're rapid firing here. So based on your experience, what are the most effective marketing strategies for CNC products? Don't make it look like a CNC product um, a lot of times. Um, and what I mean by that is try to use a CNC as a tool, but sometimes don't only use a CNC. Um, and so you may put a, you know, may do a round over on it with a router. You may do some kind of color on it. I mean, you know, it's, you can go strictly CNC based, but make sure it has some elegance to it where it's not looks like it's just slapped from a machine right onto the customer. Cause the customer can tell that. Don't ask me how they can tell it, but they can tell it. So always do some kind of iteration. Um, let's say you have a, a barrel stave from a whiskey barrel, you know, like that doesn't look like it's straight out from a CNC, but you do cut circles on it and make it a, a whiskey flight. Like that is a differentiator. So it, it's a CNC product, but it's not a CNC product because it's a barrel stave. All right, so next, uh, what pricing strategies have you found to be successful on CNC products? Yeah, these are, these are good ones. Um, so a pricing strategies, it, there's a lot of different kind of pricing strategies. Um, you know, one thing I always do, I, I, I think of a product or I, I look at a product that I kind of want to go after um, and our product line or product um, yeah, variant. And I'll see what that product, let's say it's 50 bucks and then I'll reverse engineer it. So I'll say, you know, that's $50. Okay, well, it's gonna cost me $20 in wood. It's gonna cost me $10 in CNC time. So I'm making, let's say 20 bucks on this. This is quick math, right? And it's like, well, is that okay? And do I want that? And then I'll go do that for 10 other products and I'll look at them and I'll pick the one with the biggest gap of profit. Um, and then that's the one I'll pursue 
and to try to maximize my profit. Um, that's one way I've done it, bidding out stuff and bidding out jobs. Obviously you can't do it that way. And so then you have to do cost plus pricing. So it's how much does it cost me? How much CNC time do I have? And then what's my margin and how much profit do I want to make on this? What's my time worth, etc. But if you're a product based one, look at other similar products. Don't, don't, don't base off of Chinese based products, but you know, have a, ha, do your due diligence on, on a good, what a good price for that product is and then see if you can reverse engineer it to fit your competitive advantage if someone brand new that they, they're they got a cnc machine desktop CN, benchtop cnc machine they're adequate they can make a product but they don't know where to sell it what is the one if you could recommend one sales channel whether it's etsy or build their own website or mm -hmm. craft markets one sales channel to start with. That's easy. We get a lot of flack for this. Etsy, 100%. Um, there's everybody looks at the 10% and they think it's, it's crazy. Etsy's taking 10 to 12%. If you build your own website and have to drive traffic to it, you're looking at 25 to 40% um, off the top. Even though website only charges 3% fees, you, to drive traffic there is going to be very hard. Um, and so Etsy gets you in front of millions of eyes and you can test product really quickly and know if it's gonna work or not via Etsy. And then if it does work, then you end up building your own website and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but I I mean, I've done millions and millions and millions of dollars on Etsy and I'm still doing that and it, it works. I may be a little biased, but that's my opinion and I think Etsy's a good route. For the person that, uh, this, is, this is kind of the mental part of CNC, person that's just getting started, how do you recommend uh, uh, a, a beginner to overcome the mental barriers of confidence, of skill. Um, how do you get the ball rolling if you want to start a CNC side hustle? What you have to do mentally is understand it's just another tool. That if if it goes bad, you can always sell a tool. You may be at a little loss, but you always you can always just sell the tool. So don't think of it as like you're buying something that you can never get rid of. So that that should help on the financial side. From my experience, they typically pay for for themselves in under three months. Every CNC I bought has paid for itself in under three months. So just a side note for me, um, it's always worked out that way. I mean, full price of CNC, three months done. The skill side, um, you just got to put in the reps. You know, um, a lot of people. Uh, what, what I always like to tell people, you know, buying a Bowflex and buying all this cool gym equipment does nothing to you unless you put the reps in. And so you don't have to have the most amazing CNC ever. You just have to, you have to have something to put the reps in. So like, if you can't afford the Bowflex, you can, this is my gym, yeah, yeah, gym yeah. analogy, but if you can't afford the Bowflex, you can do push-ups on the ground and you'll still be able to put the reps in. So like, you may not be able to get all the bells and whistles, but start somewhere so you can start understanding the basics and start putting those reps in. And so when you're ready to go to the gym, right, properly, then you can and it's easy and you already have the reps in and the knowledge base and you already have some of those muscles developed. All right, so so moving a little further down the road, someone that has some experience, they have, uh, I know you've been here, you had a, you had a, a benchtop CNC, uh, had a killer product. What would you recommend the next step is to scale up? You have a successful product, you have a benchtop CNC, what's the next step? One of the biggest fears that I have found with people is, Ryan, what if I sell so many and I can't keep up and I can't fulfill these orders and I'm terrified of that? I always tell people, get to that point first and then worry about it. And like, <laughs> it sounds funny, but get to that point first. I mean, sell so many that you're running that machine 24 hours a day and you have to have help come in. I've been there multiple times. The great thing about CNC machines is that when they have to run 24 hours a day, you just buy another one and then they run 12 hours a day each. And it's the most beautiful thing. And by that time, you're gonna be able to hire a part-time help or hire friends and family. Never be afraid of the, what if I sell so many I cannot keep up. After being years in business, I hope to be in that situation every single day that I am in business because that means like I have the best problem to figure out is how do I handle so much money coming in? It's like the easiest problem. You don't want to be on the other side where like I turn away sales because I don't want to get too busy and now I have none and now I can't put, you know, now I can't afford the CNC side hustle, et cetera, right? So great. We're 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 putting you through the ringer here. Yeah. We've yeah, got no, it's, it's, uh, we've got a couple good, we've got a, a couple question. more questions here. Is there any strategy to get repeat customers? Or are you going after one time purchases? Uh, so how do you engage uh, and and promote repeat 
customer? First and foremost, you've got to make a good product that they want to come back to you for. You, they will never come back to you unless you have a good product. So you can kiss repeat customers goodbye if you just make a bad product. So that's first and foremost. Assuming you make a good product, how to get repeat buyers is product positioning. So if you buy something that can, can't really be gifted and it's like a one-time purchase, mm. I don't know if you make a dining room tables, for example, right? That's a one-time buyer. Maybe you can retarget them to buy a coffee table or end table, but that's a one-time buy giant purchase. Um, I always like the whiskey and brewery market because you can sell decanters and then you can sell a flight tray and then you can sell something else that holds this whiskey bottle. Then you can sell a whiskey smoker to them yeah. and you can sell that to them. And so you have almost a group of products that you can keep retargeting customers with. So mm -hmm. make a good product and then with the product that you make, understand that if you have customers, you're going to want to retarget them with other things. And so developing that product line and going deeper on that product line is really going to help you and set you apart in that, that journey. Where should someone start when sourcing materials? What should they look for? Where should they go? What should they do? And, uh, and then talk a little bit about how you have, like you create a product, you've sold a bunch of them. How do you maintain that source? Let's put in perspective how, how I started with the materials and, and now what we're doing. So I was the guy that went to the local lumber store. The hard, you know, I went to Home Depot, bought stuff, and then I understood like there's hardwoods out there. You can't buy maple at Home Depot. And, and so I found my local hardwood distributor and just was buying a couple boards at a time from them. And then as I started buying more, I asked for discounts and stuff like that. And then now, fast forward to today, we go through about 150,000 board foot of lumber in my shop on a yearly basis. So we are milling a lot of wood. Um, we go through a couple hundred sheets of plywood every couple months. I mean, it, it's a lot of wood. So as I've progressed on that, um, I have learned that everything's negotiable. So as you're approaching different lumber distributors or hardwood distributors, you know, they have a margin they put on there, but you can always ask like, hey, if I buy five boards, can I get a little bit of a discount? Or if I buy 10 or hey, if I come back and buy a hundred board foot from you, will you discount me 10%? And just know that everything's negotiable in that hardwood industry. And, and that's helped me out because wood's gonna be about, it depends on the product, but it's usually about a 30 year cost. So if you can save 10% on a 30 year cost, you're really, you're really saving a lot of money there. And then how to maintain that relationship, once again, it's a very cooperative relationship because you're making money off of them, they're giving you a good product and they're making money off of you. And that's a really good relationship. So don't try to price gouge, you know, just like, hey man, I'm gonna be coming back. If this product works, I'm gonna be buying more stuff. Can I get a little bit of a discount? I'm just starting out, man, this would really help. And, and that does go a long way. And even if he doesn't do it the first time, he may do it the third time you come back. Last question here for you. Uh, you're a busy man. How many companies do you own? Three. So you own three companies. Yep. Uh, how do you balance production, marketing, uh, your staff, and managing the business e efficiently and effectively? So I'm not a master at this. Um, I happen to be young and have a lot of energy, so that really helps. I've developed a good team um, over the years. And I say over the years, I'm 28, but over the, over the years now I finally have people finally old enough now to have people that have stuck around. I mean, Anthony has been with me since I was 19 years old. He's my very first employee. And so he runs all the CNC's. He was starting off as a sander. Now he runs all the CNC's. I have, um, as I've grown, I've learned to train the, the A players in my company. And then they are now leading teams and, and stuff like that. And so um, as far as the production goes, I set up a lot of jigs and a lot of systems. So jigs and systems are the most amazing thing ever. You write them down and you write down why you do things certain ways, because in a year or two, you're going to look back and be like, why do we use 180 grit sandpaper? Why not 220? Or why do we use random orbital sanders and not this? And if you don't write that down, you'll go back and you have to relearn that lesson all over again. And it's, it's not fun. And you're like, ah, there it is. And I just wasted a couple hundred bucks. And so on the marketing side, I just set up part time. So let's say Wednesday at two o'clock, I make sure that I do a Facebook post, let's say, or an Instagram post. And I schedule that because I'm a very forgetful person. And so I make sure that, Hey, Wednesdays are my social media days. I go out and I film, I post, I do all that stuff. I schedule everything I need to do and I do it in a three hour window and then I'm done. I'm done, I don't have to worry about it anymore, it's off my plate. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I manage the marketing. I'm managing three companies, that's a, you know, it's an animal, um, but it's what I was put on this earth to do. And, and so 
Um, you know, but each one has its its own schedule. You know, uh, Tuesdays are YouTube, Wednesdays are Frio, um, Thursdays are my my wood shop, and then I'm, you know, I, I sleep, eat, dream, breathe this stuff. So I'm always thinking about it, always trying to problem solve. And uh, I mean, I love it, and that's why I love woodworking, and I'm so passionate about it. And, and it's just it's fun. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing in the world. So um, I don't really have any other hobbies because I just I just love this stuff so much. Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time. Again, we're here at WorkbenchCon, which is a conference for uh, makers and content creators. And I'm so glad that we got to meet up here. This is the first time yeah, we've man. met. Yeah, yeah. It's wildly <laughs> enough. It's the first time yeah. we've met. Yeah. You know. And uh, so uh, if the audience wants to find you, find your awesome content, where can they go to find you? Man. Cutting it close on YouTube. It's the very best way to find me. That's, that's it. And remember, guys, if you ain't cutting it close, you ain't cutting it right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that.